In this exercise, we um, consider quantum dots in indium arsenide nanowires. These quantum dots have different sizes, ranging from 10 nanometers to th over 30 nanometers to 100 nanometers. The first question um, asks us to discuss the differences in the appearance of these three graphs that you see depicted here. What we will look at is in particular the amplitude of the conductance resonances. Let me call it peak amplitude. And the spacing between the peaks in gate voltage, which we denote peak spacing. Now concerning these three subfigures A, B and C, we observe that the peak amplitude in case A, which is the topmost figure, is only weakly modulated. These amplitudes are almost the same over the full range of gate voltage. So we call this weakly modulated. In contrast, in case B, there is a strong change of the amplitude, but we can still kind of draw an envelope uh, of the amplitudes. So we call this um, strongly modulated. In case C, the amplitudes seem to vary in a almost random fashion. So we see increases, decreases, it goes up and down from peak to peak. So let's call this an irregular peak amplitude. The peak spacing in case A looks very regular. Whereas in case B, we already see there are small fluctuations here. We have, for example, a larger spacing here. We have a smaller spacing, but the overall impression is still quite regular. So let's say it is less regular. In the third case, the peak spacing appears to be quite irregular. Now, thinking about the origin of um, the peak amplitude, we realize that it is given essentially by the way the states, the quantum states in the dot, couple to the leads. So in case A, we have a coupling that is almost independent of the level in the quantum dot Whereas in case C, we have a coupling that depends very strongly on the level in the quantum dot. Case A is very characteristic for multi-level transport in quantum dots. This means that many single particle energy levels jointly work together to produce one conductance resonance. Since their overlap with the lead states varies statistically. The fact that we have many of these states contributing averages out these fluctuations. Case C is characteristic for single level transport. If only a single level contributes to each of these conductance resonances, then there will be strong fluctuations being a fingerprint of each individual level and its coupling to the leads. The peak spacing in turn is related to the difference of the electrochemical potentials of consecutive electron numbers. If we have a regular peak spacing, 
then this means there must be a very regular energy scale involved in the spacing, which turns out to be the charging energy. So we get regular spacings of Coulomb peaks if the separation between neighboring electrochemical potentials is mainly dominated by the charging energy and the single particle level spacing plays only a minor role. In contrast, if the single particle level spacing does play a big role, like we have it here for small quantum dots, then the spacing becomes very irregular. So this tells us that there must be a characteristic size dependence of the peak spacing from regular to irregular, going from large to small quantum dots, which we want to investigate in more detail in the second part of this problem. Here we will look at the peak spacing which we've in the lecture seen to be given by delta mu and delta mu in turn is given by the difference of the electrochemical potentials for n electrons minus the electrochemical potential for adding the n minus first electron so we've seen this expression to be um, the sum of two terms, a charging energy term E squared over the capacitance of the dot. This is charging energy term. Plus the single particle level energy delta, which we identified with the single particle level spacing. In the following we would like to estimate these two quantities um, and see how these quantities depend on the size of the system and on the number of electrons. Let me start with the charging energy. The charging energy is essentially given by the capacitance, as we can see here. So we can take the capacitance of an object that is similar to our quantum dot. In our case, we take simply a spherical approximation. And the capacitance of a sphere embedded in a dielectric medium is given by 4 pi epsilon epsilon naught times r, and r is the radius of the sphere. With this capacitance, the charging energy E squared over C takes the form elementary charge squared divided by 4 pi times epsilon, the relative dielectric constant, times epsilon naught times the radius of the sphere. So you see that as expected for a charging energy or a Coulomb energy there is a 1 over R dependence on the size of the quantum dot and these are the conventional prefactors for the Coulomb interaction. The second term we have to estimate is the single particle level spacing. Let me first sketch you the main idea of the estimate of the single particle level spacing. The main idea is to calculate the number of electrons n in a quantum dot for a given Fermi energy from the three-dimensional density of states. So the density of states gives us a number of states 
per volume and per energy. So multiplying the density of states in three dimensions, which depends on energy, of course, with the volume gives a number of states per energy interval. Multiplying with a, an infinitesimal energy interval, dE, gives the number of states in this energy interval. Now summing over all states in energy from zero energy up to the Fermi energy gives the total number of states and therefore the total number of electrons in the system. Now once we have worked out this expression, this integral, we have the density at the number of electrons as a function of Fermi energy and we would hope that we are able to con can, uh, invert this relation to find the Fermi energy as a function of electron number. As a second step, we look at the total energy of a quantum dot, the total single particle energy of a quantum dot for a given Fermi energy. This would be, in a very similar fashion, the number of states v times d 3d, the three-dimensional density of states of E, times dE. As we said, this is the number of states in this energy interval dE. And now, these states contribute to the total energy with an energy E. And if we are now summing up or integrating over all these energies from zero to the Fermi energy, we obtain the total energy of the system um, as a function of the Fermi energy. Now since we have expressed the Fermi energy as a function of number of electrons in the dot, we can use this expression now to express the total energy as a function of particle number. Once we have the total energy as a function of particle number, we can work out the electrochemical potential, mu n, and once we have mu n, we can work out the single particle level spacing delta. So this is the strategy for our solution. Now, the three-dimensional density of states we use is that for a parabolic band, which you find in solid-state physics textbooks, for example. And the expression is given by 2 divided by 2 pi squared. The factor of 2 in the numerator comes from the spin. Um, then there is 2m over h bar squared to the power of 3 half. And then there is this famous square root of energy dependence, e to the power of 1 half. In addition, we need the volume of the system. And since we work in this spherical approximation, as we did here, we will use or the volume of the system, the volume of a sphere, which is 4 pi th over 3 times the radius to the third power. Now sticking these two expressions into this integral gives us n as a function of e Fermi, from which we can calculate e Fermi as a function of n. Sticking these two terms into this integral and integrating it we get the total energy. Now from the total energy as a function of E Fermi, we insert E Fermi of n from here and obtain the total energy as a function of n. So I will not do this calculation for you here, but I'll give you a sense of the result, which is the total energy as a function of n will then turn out to be 
proportional to n to the power of 5 thirds divided by r squared. Now, from this expression, we can work out the chemical potential, mu n, as the difference e total of n minus e total of n minus 1. And we find an expression that is proportional to n to the power of 2 thirds divided by the radius squared. In a similar fashion, we can work out the single particle level spacing delta as the difference mu n minus mu n minus 1, which turns out to be proportional to n to the power of mi minus one third divided by r squared. So the important point here is to realize that the single particle level spacing decreases with one over the system size squared, while the charging energy decreases with one over the system size, one over r. So this makes us expect that for sufficiently large system size, the charging energy will always be dominant over the single particle level spacing, while for small systems, the single particle level spacing may become dominant over the charging energy. Now, since the single particle level spacing is a quantity that fluctuates from level to level, depending on the symmetry of the level, depending on the details of the confinement potential, this is a strongly fluctuating quantity. On the other hand, the charging energy fluctuates very little because the capacitance is essentially an integral property of the whole quantum dot system. Another way to see it is to say the Coulomb repulsion of two electrons averages over the full area, in some sense, of the quantum dot system. So this is a quantity that does not depend very much on the detailed geometry and the detailed geometry of the states. So this is why we saw in the previous picture um, that for very large quantum dots where the charging energy is dominant, the peak spacing delta mu, which is the sum of these two terms is mainly governed by this quantity, which the charging energy, which fluctuates very little, while for small quantum dots, the 1 over r squared behavior wins over the 1 over r, and the single particle level spacing becomes dominant, which is a strongly fluctuating quantity. And this is why the peak spacing was so strongly fluctuating. Now, in order to make things a little bit more quantitative, what you will have to do is to calculate the prefactors of this expression, or of this expression here, and then compare these two energy scales quantitatively. Now, the result of this procedure is that the charging energy which is E squared over C divided by the single particle level spacing delta has different values for different quantum dot size, for different values of R. So if we take R to be 50 nanometers, which is the case of the largest quantum dot in this problem, we get find this ratio to be roughly 3. So we see the charging energy really dominates over the single particle level spacing. 
In the second case, we take a radius of 15 nanometers and we find a ratio of 0 0.9, telling us that these two energy scales are roughly the same. For the very small quantum dot, we take 5 nanometers and find a ratio of 0 0.3, telling us that the single particle level spacing is on average now three times the charging energy, justifying the statistical peak spacing behavior.